Hey y'all, this is Harry, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And this is Daphne. I'm a dietitian, and together we are When Harry Met Daphne. As a psychotherapist, I understand how important nutrition is to mental wellness. What you feed your body will impact the way that your brain functions. So I begin to search high and low for a nutrition practitioner that I could work with to help me build a bridge between mental and physical wellness. As a dietitian, I know that if you don't dig deep into appreciating how your thoughts impact your actions and the foods you choose, you'll spend your whole life just being on a diet. And no one wants that. When Harry met me, Daphne, we started to unpack the way your mental health and your physical wellness can work together. And that's how this podcast came about. Our goal is to assist others in developing the audacity to live unapologetically authentic. Enjoy. Hey, good morning, Harry. How are you? I am not only perfectly splendid, but I must admit I am delightfully curious. Oh, that is interesting. Uh-huh. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so <laughs> I am I'm doing well today too. I'm feeling content and feeling happy Ooh. and with a bit of excitement for the future, which is not always the case. Sometimes I feel very overwhelmed and heavy and want to stick my head in the sand, but I'm not feeling that today. And it's been a pretty long, fun-filled week. So fun the fact, week. Come on. Well, fun, quote unquote, fun filled. There's a lot, there's been a lot of stuff going on this week. So the fact that I'm still feeling delighted and happy is, I think, a success for the day. Today we have Miss Jennifer Peavy. And thank you for being here. We are very happy to have you. Harry and Daphne, I am more than happy to be here. It's been really exciting to get ready for this show. How do you feel today? I am doing well today. I have had a number of meetings this week and they all went well. And so I feel in a way vindicated, or at least I can relax for the holidays. I feel like Mm. I'm going into them very well and and, and anticipating a really good week next week. So tell us a little bit, Jennifer, about your yourself, your kind of history and how you got to where you are being, you're an author. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I I come from a varied background. I actually started in engineering. It was what my father did, so it felt appropriate. I did spend a lot of time in technology, but found that I wanted to understand why I was developing what I was doing. And so I ended up going more the business side or innovation side of things where we were able to try to say, okay, this is what people want and this is what we should be developing. As I went through that, I started learning about this entire people side of things and about how people would like what we made and why they would purchase it or interact with it. And so I got into industrial design. And so if you know anything about those groups, it, it, they're very different groups from one another. At one point, I actually left corporate because I was burnt out and I wanted to start my own freelancing business. And part of what was going on with that was I wasn't sure what to offer. I have this technical engineering, I have this innovation management, this design, and they're very different from one another. I would talk to people about all three. And and I always felt like if I could bring all three to the table, I'd had this superpower of being able to put all these non-obvious connections together, but it didn't fit really the mold of everything that was out there. And each area also had its own process. So I also was trying to figure out how would I offer this? I was used to doing things in each of its silos. So one of the things I did as we went into lockdown, and I'm starting a freelance business as we go into lockdown, so you can imagine how that went, was I was trying to figure out what my process would be. And I ended up creating a structure in my life that allowed me to spend some time reflecting on things, which I have a high level of intuition. So I knew if I could spend time doing that, then I would have a better chance of having higher quality actions. So I created that structure and I found it actually brought me some of that joy and some of the peace and contentment. I felt like I knew where I was going when I was able to create that structure in my life. All right. So tell us whenever you say structure of, you created a structure of reflection, what does that mean? Like whenever you say reflection, what does reflection mean to you? Sure. So a very broad definition is that idea of slowing down and listening. And so for me, my structure was I actually created a time and the twist that I did was actually look at nature and say, how does nature put reflection and action together? And my specific metaphor was I looked at the moon phases and said, okay, as we have the darkness of the moon with the new moon, I would spend more time reflecting. And then as we get into the full moon, as it would grow with light, I would have more and more action and then reverse back. So I allowed myself to have this cycle. I really was just using the moon as a timepiece on saying, okay, this is when I'm going to do these things. 
because I can get distracted. I can end up in one place and that's particularly the engineer side of me or sometimes the creative side of me. I'll get really excited about something and I'll just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going and not really stop and think, is this where I want to be or is this what I want to do? And so for me, reflection was spending a moment and listening. I might ask myself questions. Really, originally, it was just trying to reconnect with my feelings. And part of that was the physical sensations of, do I like the options before me? Are these things that I want to engage with? And if there were some that were not, okay, well, which ones do I? And then I would ask myself the questions of why. And it would help me know what actions I should move forward with. It would bring me joy. Mm-hmm. So it sounds, I hear two things. And that's why I'm moving around a little bit because I want to make sure I don't lose these two because I say them often. And, and since they come up so often, I think I'm able to spend a little bit more time understanding these concepts. Uh, there's a certain level of knowingness that I know right now, but it's always a deeper level of knowingness that we can go. So I'm going to embark on that journey a little bit deeper. But interoception and introspection, that's what I'm hearing come up, those two themes, interoception and introspection. That's what I, when you're talking about that inward reflection, I hear introspection, which is, I moved into the space of shadow work, which is just no more than another phrase or energy, you know, combination of words to represent that introspection. And then sensing from inside the body is the, the interoceptive component of it. So I'm hearing a lot of that. Is that what you're pretty much honing on? Yeah, definitely. I didn't, I do the introspection, but not the other of those words, but definitely it was this connecting of the logic with the feelings and being able to say, and you could say, is that reflection and action? Because I, I, at least with me, when I start thinking, there's a lot of action going on with that. And sometimes there's a lot of spinning. And so being able to listen, like even today, I start my day, I have a practice and then a process, but if I start my day and I give myself four different prompts and one of them is about energy level. And I actually assign a number to it and might be the geeky in me that likes to do that. But part of that is so I can track it because I want to know if it significantly went up or significantly went down. I want to know why. I can connect with that up. so much because I always, I I do everything on a scale. So whenever I'm working with clients on a scale from one to 10, how do you, how do you feel? How is your stress level on a scale? From, when I'm talking to my son and I'm yeah. like, instead of saying, are you hungry? I'll say on a scale from one to 10, how hungry are you? Cause that lets right. me know, like I, I do everything on a scale because it's, and I guess it's kind of the nerd part of me too, that I can, if I can assign a number to it, then I know how important it is or I know how it's changed. And exactly. guess what? The, the, you are building up when you do that. You are building up his interoceptive skills as well, because you're asking him to sense his body and give him give you something specific instead of this vague behind. I'm hungry. Give me yep. something. Right. You know, like that. That just something as simple as that on a scale of one to ten. How hungry you are? He by the time your son goes to college, he should have some sensei level interoceptive skills. And he didn't even he doesn't even know the simple question. It can be just as easy. It's it's simple, but it's something new that we have to adopt deliberately. And then intentionality, which I know we're going to go into, intentionality reflects relationship. We say that we desire a thing. We see, I'm not going to jump. You know what? I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Doc, we're going to get into it. You're good. You're absolutely Ooh. good because it is yeah. like a foreign language. And I think for me, at least I needed lockdown actually was a good thing for me. So I, I hate to celebrate that, but it forced me to slow down and learn that language. And as you say, it's not something we necessarily teach each other. So I kind of interrupted you a little bit. I didn't no, want to fine. interrupt you. Tell me about, you said that you have a practice and a process or a process and a practice. Yeah. So my, so my practice is what I do first thing in the morning. And that, that's where I go into this. What is my number? And I can even see my number for a year ago and I know things are better. I wouldn't necessarily without that number know that. What's interesting, though, that might be good when you talk with your son is because the gut doesn't, you know, the gut's with the basal ganglia and doesn't necessarily have coherent thought. I end up presenting a number and then I just kind of get a yes or no from my gut. So it's kind of interesting for me to achieve the number is I have to actually have a conversation between the rational and, and the gut. So I have that number. The second thing I do is I just try to think of something I'm grateful for. And then that helps me with some motivation and connects me 
because that's that whole negativity that tends to run through my head naturally. And then, so therefore I'm trying to pull myself from that. The second thing I do as well in that vein is I look for what I'm either scared of or unsure about. And I identify that and I kind of say, well, why? And then I give myself a statement of faith. So I want to flip it around positive as well. And then the last thing I label as desire, and this is really more about what is it that I need today that will nourish me? And this is really in a way, not only nourishing me, but I'm building self-trust. Because if I tell myself that I want, for example, laughter, so therefore I'm going to make sure I choose things on television or on podcasts or whatever it is that is going to make me laugh instead of, you know, I, I tend to end up with dramas a lot. And there's only so many crime murder dramas you can watch without it starting to affect <laughs> whether I laugh or not. And I'll notice that over time. Okay, I need laughter today and I'll be more intentional about that. So that's, that's just me checking in. My process was more about this reflection and action about when I'm going to think about my projects. When am I going to uh, have more action on them and I'll increase my action. One of the things that happened was I followed the moon as a new thing because I had all of these processes from my background. What I found was with that cycle, there was almost this sinusoidal wave that went with it. How much light was there? How much there wasn't? And I found it actually mirrored very well with what I did in design. So in the beginning, you start dreaming and you start thinking about what, what is my intent for this moon? What do I want? And then I go into planning for it. What is the mental preparation? So like gathering all my supplies type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I would go into the first quarter moon and I would prototype which is something that we would often do in design is, okay, what is a good enough? Let's just prove if this is something worth doing. Mm -hmm. Then with the, the waxing gibbous after the, the first quarter is I would refine that. And that was actually a big deal for me because the engineer made me want everything to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in first quarter, I have to go, no, Jennifer. And I, I would limit. And that's the other beautiful thing is I only have three days. I give myself the day before and the day after of, of that moon and say, I only have three days to create this new thing. So because of the time limit, I also then have to be very efficient about what I do. And it's really just proving, is this worth investing any more in it, into it is my question. Mm -hmm. And I may have a more specific question about it. You know, do, did I like it? Did I like what I did? Did it, did it solve my intention, my problem? And if it is, then the next phase, I will actually start refining it. When I get to the full moon, I will actually stop. And this is something that we would do at the end of a project is we would stop and then think about what we just did. So I've done all of this action and doing and doing and doing, but then we stop and say, how did it work? Did it go well? Did it fit what my intention was? And I'll just gather these insights. And the way I would do it in the studio is it would be post-it notes. And so I don't have them here, but you know, I, I will have a wall of post-it notes of insights on what I learned. And some of it will be about how I feel. Some of it will be about the project itself. Some of it might be about how it connected with something else. I, I start to see systems rather than just the project I'm in. The next is with the waning gibbous. And at that point, this was actually a pretty big deal. I... Um, Normally in a studio, once we have all of that together, we would present to the client. Well, I was my client. And so I said, you know, I should present to myself, which was a radical thing because I was very good at critiquing other people's work, but I would never give it to myself because I was so into the details of the action of it. So what I would actually put together a presentation and say, this is what I learned. This is what I meant to do. And then I would stop and breathe and switch hats and become the client and start telling myself, well, I really appreciated that you did this and this is what I see. And so it was almost like going from the details up into a, a high level view of how does that fit again with the systems. The next phase with the last quarter, what we would do in studio is actually clean up. And part of that was getting ready for the next project because we're creatives and we're chaotic and there would be mess all over the place. <laughs> So then to be able to start the next moon, that was the time where we would document, you know, everything would be finalized and we would clean up. And then the next with the waning crescent is I would rest. And that's just giving my brain then time to let go and clean. And then that allows me again with the new moon to review that and say, okay, do I want to go again? Is this, I want to continue this project or am I going to have a new project? Very so interesting. 
I used to always laugh whenever I would work with engineers that had diabetes. They oh. would want to know like every single detail of every single thing and just so technical. And yeah, yeah. so to be able for you to bridge the technicality with the creativity, I think is an interesting bridge to to look at your the way that you're living your life. I think that's very fascinating. It, it's a battle a lot. And that's one reason I like the structure is because it uses both. Uh, the engineer is really good at the, the action and the details, but then the designer is good about the overseeing. And, and I find that cycle is I'm moving in and out, not only, you know, details to overview, but to actions, to reflection, but also to do list and then freedom just to be. So that's happening as well. Every master, every person who reaches a certain level of self-mastery has their own process. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection of self-discipline because there's no way to live a life of authenticity if you're not self-disciplined because a life of authenticity is a lifestyle. Life itself exists on a rhythm. It exists in pattern. I mean, the, the great genius is Tesla, we know. And when people who begin to do that introspective work begin to dive deeper, they get to see their own pattern existing in the patterns they see out here. And then they can make the connection that the yeah. physical is no more than a manifestation of one's own spiritual truths. Yeah, I, there are many times. And one reason I liked the moon was the fact that it's always out there. But to that point of connecting outside of myself, it, it did allow me to look outside of myself to connect with nature and just say, this is a pattern I see in nature. And if I mimic that pattern, then it allowed me to feel a, a lot more out, outside of myself and not get all caught up in my own thoughts. And then you raise your heart resonance enough to where you begin to see the other as a different version of yourself. Yeah. And so not only nature, which is non-threatening for most of us and relaxing and natural, but then you get to see the person that completely has a different set of beliefs from you. I do want to take one of the quotes that you had on your website about intention and reflection. So you'd said, to develop a process that brings our life success, we should intentionally create an environment where we encourage moments of reflection. So it sounds like you, I mean, obviously you've created this process and you've allowed this place where all of this can be nourished, this, this environment where you can nourish the process of reflection as you go through this, these cycles. Talk to us a little bit about intentionality, how you have to be intentional and why you have to be intentional to be able to see this process of reflection through. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll start with my story. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it goes back to that, that engineer and getting caught in details. And some of it was busyness, you know, they're, they're, you're rewarded for a certain amount of busyness, or a certain amount of achieving or whatever it is. So the intentionality for me began as I am going to choose to create this space or this time for myself that I'm going to do this. It is a conscious choice. I think as much as it is, and, and as much, you know, as much as an artist or a creative just wants to say, I'm in the state of flow and I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. For me, I do find, and this is one reason I call it structure is that I say, this is what I commit myself to. Now I'm committing that cycle or that intention is free to be changed as I grow. And, and I know it's not permanent, but I do allow it to say, this is how I'm going to deal with it for this month. Commitment. And, and intention for me, okay. a lot of it is a more about that. There was one definition that I heard, you know, desire is actually, and I don't know if it's the Latin or the Greek is about reaching for the stars. So, or it is from the stars yeah, desire, but then intention is actually reaching out to meet it. And so, as opposed to a goal, which a goal is an end point. And so I also look at it as attention is part of that process, part of that practice as being something that is, as you say, a lifestyle, as opposed to saying, this is what I'm going to achieve this year. It is something that I desire. It's not something that I'm lacking. What's interesting about it is I will set an intention while I'm dreaming in that <laughs> beginning stage, I will set an intention and I will say, this is how I want to feel. Not so much what I want to do, but how do I want to feel? Now, as I get into all of the action and all the details, I realize I have a certain set of expectations. 
my intentions and my expectations generally do not match because I will expect something that's far more perfect or far more tangible or far more short-sighted, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of being able to come back for me and, and intentionally spend setting a time to review is I will see that because I'll forget it's been, it's been two weeks, three weeks. I can easily forget in a day, but I'll go back and read. What was my intention? What was my good enough? Cause I'll, I'll define that as well. And then I'll see what happened and I'll see, I met that two weeks ago. What have I been doing for the last week? I've just been stressing myself out with these expectations. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's always something that I, at the end of the month, even though I didn't meet my expectations, I met my intentions and I can feel good about that. Thank you for that, Doc. And that, let me jump in here real quick. Because there's so much you got to say. I don't want to cut you off. There's so no, much you're you fine. Have, so much you said. Oh, no, I wanted to cut you off way earlier. But I wanted to continue <laughs> to flow. But now I just can't take it no more. So <laughs> the intentional part. So, I, so words words are, I believe, important depending on the context. Well, words are important all the time. But definitely even more powerful depending on the context. And so the I am statements that we make on a daily basis this is why I don't care for the words want, because when you look at the definition of want, it says lack. And so in saying I want a thing, you're saying I am, I'm lacking a thing or I am lack. And so I, I always tell my people, it's, you know, it's, I, I use the words I desire. I say, I understand what you say when want, because that's the, that's the word that everyone uses. And you got to speak to English. It is an English word and we need to, we know how it's used. So use the word, but also understand the energy behind it. So if you're going to use the word want, make sure that in your mind, you have that desire because that way you don't attach yourself. Want, when you say I lack, that means that I'm going to go out and search, or at least I should be searching for something that I do not have that I actually need. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to operate and, and energize our aura to that of lack, because all it does is invite in more lack. You know, instead, like you said much earlier about the don't want, that's another thing that I, I, I practice from time to time. My people is teaching them how to affirm. And so Tell me what it is that you actually desire. Well, I don't want, no, that's a don't want. You're looking at your fears and that's why whatever you fear at, you attract whatever you resist persists because what you're staring at is your fears and wherever attention goes, energy flows. We don't see things as they are, but as we are, perception is reality. All you're perceiving is your fears. How do you make that in the affirmative? Right. And that's the struggle. Yes. That's the struggle because people are so attuned to the to, to the lower frequency of the mind, which is only looking for threats, searching for threats, that they don't even know how to affirm their right. truth or even choose a vision. Because what are you moving towards? What is your North Star? And I say intentionality reflects relationship. And so you were talking about what am I committing to? And when you say commitment, that's like, that's akin to marriage. What am I marrying myself to today or for this week or for this moment, you know? And so intentionality reflects relationship. A marriage is a relationship. The more that you are intentional about responding to that thing, the deeper the relationship becomes because you're communicating through the, through the response itself. It's not so much what happens in the physical. I moved into the social, we, we moved into the social influence and thought leader space we get so caught up. Originally, we got so caught up, or at least I got so caught up on what it looked like that I forgot the universal principle because I was operating off the mind that was seeking out these specific outcomes immediately. But I know that success is an endurance game. What is it that I need to remember? Intentionality reflects relationship. It doesn't have to look perfect. It could look like a failure every single day to my mind. But if I'm being intentional about responding to my North Star, the more attention I pour into that, the more I stare at that, the more attention, the more energy I'm pouring into that, mm -hmm. and the denser it becomes in a quantum field until it collapses into this physical reality. I will have exactly what I choose as long as I don't give up fate staring at it. I have to continue to be intentional. I have to see already what's not already there. I have to experience the experience before I experience it. We You're have a great. lot in common, Doc. We have a lot in common. Wait, <laughs> I keep calling you Doc. You Doc? You Doc? No, I'm not. I'm not. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> I just saw the word doc. I saw the pictures and I was like, this surely she's a doc, you know, no. <laughs> but that there, even the pictures behind you, I was thinking about all of that. People don't even know the simple things that you can do to start to fine tune your mind because by surrounding yourself with your craft, with all of these pictures, I know you, the listeners, they can't see these little square pictures that you have up of different moon cycles, I think, and symbols well, and stars. Well, they're actually, it's actually string art. Stream, stream, stream art. 
String. String. So, String. so nails. Okay. And then thread going through the nails. Ooh, that's that Tesla uh, pattern right there. That's that. Is what it? is it called? The universal. It's not the Tesla pattern. It's the universal pattern. Yeah. That's it. See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? This is a craziness. You don't even know that you got the whole, you've got the whole code right there. You hold the whole universe in your hand right there. That's it. That's it. But you surround yourself with these things because even if you're up and up watching Netflix, your eyes, as you get up, you turn, you see that. Again, intentionality reflects relationship. Whatever you stare at becomes a reality. You are intentional about putting the things that you value and matter to you in your, your eyes, your mind's physical space so that you can continue to remind it that this is significant to you. So it never forgets. And what's interesting, what I've I've had to do over this time period, and this is actually a very good example of of this, is normally the engineer in me, I would make an enormous string art and I would try to create one big thing. And what was important, at least while I was doing this, was making one at a time. And, and, and just creating it. And therefore now I have this enormous thing. You know, I've got 50 of these up here now. And, and I, I'd like to finish the entire wall. But there are many days that I get up and I, I don't, I can't see the progress or I, I don't feel that there's enough progress and I have to deal with the negativity of I'm, I'm beating myself up that not enough's getting done. But I have to remind myself, you, know, you were, I, I want to change my metaphor to, to something you were talking about, but Prior to this, I would say it's a brick and a wall. And all I have to worry about is that, that brick, that one bite for that one day. And I tell myself, I can handle that. I can handle laying that one brick or I can handle making that one piece of string art as opposed to worrying about the entire wall at once. Now, there will be times like at the new moon would I dream with the intention where I'll step back and look at the whole wall and say, well, which brick do I want to work on? Mm-hmm. for this day or this month, or I want to work on this section, or I would like it to have a tower at the end as opposed to just a flat wall. I can redesign mm-hmm. it at that point when I have that decision. So it again. sounds like that that whole thought process, I consider myself to be a recovering perfectionist. I realize sometimes that I have not recovered as much as I would like to think that I have recovered <laughs> because that it floats up sometimes. I'm like, okay, I, I recognize you that you are trying to stop this process. And sometimes I'll let the perfectionism stop. So talk to me a little bit about how you were able to move past the idea of perfectionism and use those ideas like just like you were talking about the spring art use like you're still moving in the path that you want you're still laying that one brick but without having to look at the whole entire project and make sure that it's all absolutely perfect before you present any part of it Mm -hmm. i think the the one big shift for me i was an engineer for 20 years and then i was a designer for about 10 and and innovation management kind of overlaps on those One big paradigm shift for me was the idea of it doesn't happen in one iteration because the engineer with me was like, you do things once. And I would tell people I'm ultimately lazy. That's why I don't want to repeat. I don't like repeating work. I'm awful at maintenance. I don't like to mow the lawn. I don't like cleaning. I do it, but I hate it because it happens again and again. But I had to have a complete shift that said, every time I did an iteration, I was going to learn something So that the next time I did it, it would be better. And a lot of it in design was because I was talking to other people and having them critique what I had done. And therefore I could see it through their eyes as opposed to just mine. So allowing myself to believe that if I repeated work, that each time I repeated it, it would get better. And it wasn't the fact of mowing the lawn just because it grew. It was because I learned something as I made it, that therefore the next time I could make it better. The process is most important, more important than the product and destination. Yeah. Happiness is not a destination to be reached. It's the way we travel. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I can keep going. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And I had, I, that paradigm shift was the one for me. Now, yes, I'm still in a way striving for a high level of excellence. If we want to use that word instead of perfection, (laughs) because I know what I like. I know when I see it, you know, I love the fact that all these are together, but every one of them is not perfect. The power of it is because of all of them. Right. As opposed to one that is absolutely perfect. 
But I can tell you in the journey while I was in school, and I, I went back to school at 42 to get my industrial design degree. And so I'm in, you know, in the room with a bunch of people that I could be their mother. And it was interesting. And they came from all sorts of varied backgrounds. So I moved to, okay, I will make two iterations, but I'm going to work really hard on that first iteration that I'm going to think through at least three iterations in my head. And then realizing that feedback was helping me. When I finally got to my final project, I got to five. I was very proud of myself that I had five <laughs> iterations to make a to make a the, the my final presentation, and I can even see that in other students as they would come along. I go, oh, if it had just been one more iteration, how good that would have been. <laughs> now, this last adventure with the book, there were seven revisions. Wow. And yes, I could still see even more, but I, I look at that number, like we were talking about data earlier, and I say, okay, you know, it, it's taken me a decade to get to this point, but I believe in five iterations. I think that's a reasonable number. Right. That Yes, you're going to do it. it you're going to get to 80 or 90% good. And yeah, you could keep going, but it's not worth the effort, but that's good enough. And that's the other thing that I have to do is define the good enough for that good iteration yeah. and then celebrate the success. And I think that was part of the perfectionist is I would not celebrate until it was absolutely done. Right. Mm. I can relate. I can relate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and the journey is not that. It's it's happiness. Again, I have to define this and remind people constantly when I'm in my talks and even in my practice that happiness is to do that, which invites in the experience of happiness. Yep. So if you say only when. Right. If when. If you say I'm only going to be happy or I'm only successful whenever I make it to the top of the mountain, then you're missing all of the challenges that you've overcome and all the strength that you're developing with each step. And indeed, you have failed every single step that you've taken until you reach the mountaintop because you said I am not successful until I reach the mountaintop, which then makes that journey much longer and much more miserable, honestly. Well, but, and, go ahead. And I found if I did not celebrate, I'd give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would never reach it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a little too much if you take it all in one swallow, you know, right. mm -hmm. or if you only celebrate that once and don't. So I make a, a, a there's a good analogy that I, I wrote on Medium. It's about how gemstones are formed. And so there's this whole idea, you know, we've got all these layers of the earth. And there's a certain time that the magma will flow up through volcanoes and that's how we get diamonds, but it's the shifting plates is how we get rubies and emeralds and sapphires. And so, you know, there are all sorts of people who mine for these things, but you go down and you have to find that particular crevice and they pull it out of the earth. Well, then there are layers and palm layers of calcium or quartz or whatever it is that it takes to get down to it then that is then sold and then cut into smaller shapes that could be made into a gem that then could be then put into a, a piece of jewelry. The thing is the person who's doing the mining sets a value to what he pulls out of the ground. It's not like it's sold for nothing or when they cobble all of the, the quartz and the calcium off of it, that still has a value, just like the one who cuts it down. You know, there are all of those different steps and, and everybody would say each one of those has a value. Now, granted, the one that's with the diamonds and the gold that's in the tiara on my head, you know, that certainly has the most dollar value to it, but it doesn't mean that the rest of them did not. Mm -hmm. not yeah, all not all value is measured by dollars. Right. Yes. And right. the true intrinsic value, not at all, but in dollars is just influence and it's something that we created. It's, it's an energy, right. my is an energy, but also that same miner was specific on what it was searching for. Yep. And so if it went down, it didn't go down and grab rubies. If it was searching for diamonds, right. it got what it was searching for. So another, if, if the physical is a manifestation of spiritual truths, the question is, what have you been searching for? Have you ever even asked yourself that question? Yep. What is it that you truly desire? What is your diamond? What is your North Star? You know, if you don't, if you don't have that, then you're not really, you don't know if you're going in the right direction. Right. Those again are only created so that we know that we're going in the right direction, you know, right. but it's really about the process. The direction, what determines your direction is your values because it's your values that give you fulfillment. 
So you move in that direction and you set up goals and these goals let you know, hey, you're on the right direction. You celebrate as you get these different goals. You know, me and Daphne, we just made it to 2,000 downloads. <laughs> so, and we do in fact have a plan to celebrate. So we're going to yes. get together and we're going to celebrate. That's great. Celebrate. <laughs> yes, we're going to celebrate. But, then that's the thing, you know? So are we... Do we have that the show on CBS yet or whatever? No, you know, and maybe that's not even an alignment for the stars, but what we're doing, it begin as a value and it's going to continue as a value. Whatever it looks like in this physical plane, right. it's irrelevant because right. the reward is in doing that, which is important to you or living in your truth, living in your values, because it's only when you live in truth that you are lit up for life. And all you got to do from that point forward is let your light shine. You're made up of stardust. Your skeletal structure made up of stardust. You were born to shine. I mean, it's, it's so many different connections. Uh, you know, it's, it's all interwoven. It's, it's just like those the, that art that you have. It's all connected. And when we begin to see that not only do these universal truths exist, but they are interwoven. They cross one another in like so many different ways. It's clear. That's why I lump a lot of the things that I say together when I recite certain things, such as perception is reality. Right. Whatever you stare at becomes your reality. Wherever attention goes, energy flows. We don't see things as they are, but as we are. What I'm doing is I'm being multilingual and speaking to different professions and different lines of thought so that they can see the thread that's connecting all of it. It doesn't matter what you believe. I don't yeah. care about what you believe. If yep. you go deep yep. enough, we all reach the same center, just like the earth. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. It sounds like your all of these experiences or some of the, a lot of the experiences that you had over the quarantine and trying to develop this craft of going through your cycles and connecting, connecting nature with, with what you're trying to, your reflection, you put together in a book and a workbook, correct? I did. What I, I first did was a workbook for myself. Okay. And when I was finding that working well for me, and it, and it was basically what I said about the design process within the moon phases. So I've got it all in a way that I can fill it out, so to speak, or I can mm -hmm. record things. And I started showing that to people. And there were a number of people who just thinking, because there was so much stress going around because of the lockdown. And I said, let's, let's just see if this resonates with people. It was also freelancing. So maybe it was a revenue source. Right. I came across someone that actually had gone through and written a book with a, a group at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with them and they came back and said, well, really, it'd be better off to write the book. So I, it was an opportunity. I never set out to be an author, mm -hmm. but there was this opportunity, just like I never really knew about design until it showed up. So I went ahead and took it and went into this realm of writing things down. And if, and I'm sure you said you'd worked with engineers, Daphne, you, we are not known for writing well. So this was <laughs> this a big thing to go down this path. It was an iterative process. So I was able to, to understand it pretty well, like the design process, we would write and then we would get feedback and then we'd start putting these Legos together to create chapters. And at some point we get an overall vision of it. And somebody said, you know, you're a good case study, Jennifer, but People are different. And, and you know what Harry's been saying about all the different languages. If I broaden what I was doing about just personal process development, and by the way, I, my twist was on looking to nature for inspiration. And so that's really what the book is more about is saying, okay, there's this cult of action and, and making this argument that we get sucked into busyness. And then it would be helpful to have this on your own personal process. And then I go into a section talking about here's how nature can inspire us on how to put reflection and action together. And then finally, I go into a section on how would you apply that? And that's really going back to that iteration. So let's try laying that one brick, try it out, see if it worked. If you have to take it out, fine. If not, we build another brick and try, try something else with that. Now, I am working on my own workbook and making it larger. So before it was just about the moon. Well, that's a light thing, as I said before. Well, now I'm looking at light on a year. So I have the moon spinning within the year. So for example, like right now with December and it's getting darker, I'm going into a resting season, which is really difficult with the holidays to pull off. But that's <laughs> my intention is to pull back. And then in January, I'll start dreaming. And so it's almost like I have a, a moon within the, the year. Okay. 
And so the name of the book is Natural Reflectors. Yes. Yes. And it has the book and then the journal or the workbook that goes with it. Where can this book be found? So that can be found on Amazon and that's about 50% there. If not, you know, it's Barnes and Noble and Kobo and things like that. But Amazon is definitely the easiest way. Okay. Mm -hmm. And speaking of process, Daphne and I will be coming out with our self care formula for the entire year coming soon, coming soon. Well, by the time this airs, it'll be out. So just check the website, whatever website I post at that time, just check the website. I'm speaking from the future right now. Just, (laughs) Yes. So it's great to hear your process. And, you know, I always feel like I have to do things and processes also. So I'm a very, I tease my husband and say, I'm a very linear thinker. So I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this where my husband thinks in a word cloud. It's just like all these things that he's going to do. And he's just kind of randomly grabbing at them with no in my mind, the way that I see it, there's no organization or structure to it because I think very linearly. And it sounds like you have a very similar way of thinking that we're like, you've created this structure and you've created this process and you test it and see how it works. And if it works, the things of the in the process that work, you pull those things out and reuse that to create the next process or the next phase of the process. So I can very much understand and connect with what you're saying. It it makes perfect sense to me. And it's funny, the irony is the reason I did it is because I'm more like your husband. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm all over the place. (laughs) <laughs> but I wasn't completing anything and I wasn't satisfied. And so right. that's how it began with this structure was to at least be able to say, oh, there's progress. Yes. Uh, uh, Very good. Uh, look, look beyond the words and you can see the universal thread no matter where you where you look at when someone is speaking from on heart resonance. And so the thing that came up for me is a divided house cannot stand. Mm-hmm. Now, again, that's applied in certain contexts, but divided divided vision you won't you won't progress you have to be very you yeah you can look at everything but then you have to be very specific in what you give attention to just like if you were talking to someone you don't like when they're like talking to other people why they talking to you on the phone that's a thing for other people it's a thing for me but you know (laughs) you, you want people's attention i know that my clients they they want my undivided attention but Whenever you are split like that, you're not giving your vision the attention that it deserves, that you need for it to collapse into this physical reality, then you're essentially just doing, right. not really progressing much. You're progressing, right. but you're moving at Newtonian speed instead of light speed, which takes a lot longer. You got to get in your car, you got to get gas, you got to make sure that you <laughs> feel good. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, it was great to have you. It was a great conversation. I loved hearing about your process. Thank you both, Harry and Daphne. This has been fabulous. Thank you. Where can people find you? So my website, jenniferpv.com, and then my social media handles on Instagram and Facebook are at jennifer.theblacklab. The Black Lab, as referring to a dog, right? Yes, and it's also my freelancing business. So part of that was saying it would be a lab where we're experimenting. And because she's a black lab that, that went really well. And she's very curious. So I felt like that was a a good, we used to, in my house, we moved last year, but in the house that we lived in previously, we had a place, what would, in most people would call a man cave for my husband, we called the lab. So it was like, it was the lab on our, our, you know, piece of property that he would go into. And for that exact reason, because you never knew what was going to be going on, what was going to be bubbling up in there. And so the lab is, I can definitely, again, relate to that one. So fuzzy front end. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, it was great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we appreciate you. Anyway, not you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the When Harry Met Daphne show. We have much love and appreciation for you all. We enjoy handing out these spiritual stakes and assisting others in developing the audacity to live unapologetically authentic. Our goal is to share as much as we can and to raise the vibrational frequency of as many people around us as possible. As we know, a rising tide raises all ships. Please leave a rating for our show on whatever podcast platform you're listening to and share it with your friends. Our ability to continue to bring this podcast to you is through donations to our show. You can do this through patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash when Harry met Daphne. Much love and respect to you all. Agape. Agape.